Thank you very much. Um, okay, cool. Uh, time for everyone. Thank you so much once again. Um, for coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so um, first let's start off with Yeshiva. Um, how did it all start? What made you leave your lucrative job investment banking to literally give us a shot? Uh, very good question. Thank you for everybody. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, so yeah, how did it all start? Um, so I actually started, if you want the real start, with about five years ago. So um, I was a banker uh, about ten years. Um, you know, and I'm a Muslim, so I totally get it. Look, it's really hard to find a partner. Speak to any Muslim you know, everybody will say the same thing. Oh, it's really hard, etc., etc. I looked at what was out there, and what was out there was pretty terrible. Um, you know, we had horrible, awful, you know, horrible websites that people found very expensive. The quality wasn't that great, the security wasn't that great, etc, etc. And then the offline means, so matchmakers, your family, etc. Uh, a lot of people had, had really come to a dead end on that front. So I thought, okay, how could we do things differently? So initially when I was first at work, um, I actually started, and I was speaking to someone earlier, um, called it a Muzmatch website, um, which tried to do things differently to how it was done at the time. This was in 2012, I think. Um, it got to about 2013, and I could really see apps, uh, you know, really taking off. Apps becoming really popular, especially in the call of the dating space, um, the non-Muslim market. And I thought, actually, if somebody does something for the Muslim market and does it really well to a high standard and a high quality, this could be something big. So, um, 2014, I decided to quit my job. I learned how to build apps, uh, and within about six months, um, literally in kind of true startup fashion, in the bedroom of my home. About six months, learned how to build kind of Apple apps, Android apps, and launched version 1.0, um, which was launched April 2015. Ran it for about a year, um, just on my own, and we got to about 60 odd thousand signups. Um, but the limiting factor was essentially me, and I thought, how can we take this to the next level? How can I kind of really achieve the ambitions that you know that we wanted? And that's where Ryan comes on board. So I actually found Ryan on, on LinkedIn, and I'll let, I'll let Ryan finish the story. Thank you, Ryan. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so Shaz emailed me nearly just under two years ago, kind of the new year of uh, 2016. And being, I had two startups myself before this. I was also kind of a sole founder CEO, so I knew how hard it could be. And what kind of caught my eye with Shaz is that he'd actually done it himself as well. So he'd you know, quit his job and he actually learned how to write apps. And a lot of people out there have lots of ideas and they kind of expect a technical person, perhaps someone like me potentially, to come on board and kind of do that side of the business. But with tech startups, it can't be like that. You know, everyone really has to be a maker in the team. And instantly I saw the potential, right? You know, it's, a, it's one of those things by 2016, you hear of an app idea, idea and you look out and you see, right, what hasn't been done and it's hard to find things that haven't been done, right? And you, and you think about this opportunity and it was like, wow, this is a, a huge opportunity. And yeah, it was a hard problem and it is a hard problem, but it kind of went from there, I guess. Sorry, I don't want to hold it, hold it. <laughs> Building on that, um, Ryan, how do you find being, I guess, a white guy in the Muslim team? <laughs> uh, it's good fun, actually. I, I think the big thing is how hard this problem is. So it's being non-Muslim, you might think it's just one giant niche, you know, with all the same problem, but it's not that at all. And also, I think as well, it's understanding that not even in the West, where there's not necessarily a huge amount of Muslims, density-wise, but even in the Far East, say, it's still a huge issue. You know, when you research, you know, there's, there's these kind of areas that you can't cross and these certain criteria, it makes it incredibly difficult. So I think it's, yeah, it's just been learning the insights, but again, it's just people, right? You know, it's like any product, you know, with consumers, and when it, you know, when it boils down to it, it's just people trying to find their future spouse. I don't want to tackle that as well. I remember when I was looking for a co-founder, um, I really didn't care if it was or not. You know, for me, it was finding someone, uh, ultimately first, who you trust, because it's so important when you're, when you're trying to Establish that partnership from the start, um, but also somebody who brought a lot to the table. You know, Ryan obviously is super technical. He brings a lot. You know, like I mentioned, he had two kind of startups himself. Um, so there's real world experience there, um, and not only that, it was um, his insight and in a way his different insight from mine. So I'm Muslim in this space, and you know, let's say I get it, and I have I have my own preconceived notions of how things should be done. But with Ryan, it's, you know, this is all new, um, which is which is a benefit in itself because you'll see things in a different way. Uh, you know, together we'll think about things slightly differently to how things have been done. And the purpose of Muzmatch and the, the way we're trying to do this is exactly that, to do things differently from how it's been done. Because we know the way it's been done for a lot of people have been, it's been, it's been painful, it's not been that great. And we're trying to do things, inshallah, a little bit differently, um, kind of step by step, but in the right direction. Yeah, 
Um, to rewind a bit, so um, just like you obviously invest at Banker, what were you doing around before? You obviously mentioned that um, you sold one of your businesses, what was that startup? How did you get into the stuff? Yeah, so I was, uh, I was doing consulting at the time in iOS, so I had two startups in the event space and I'd done some professional experience as well, and it was made, made, uh, mainly web development stuff. And I could quickly see after those two startups that there was kind of a hole in my kind of ability, which was mobile development. So I managed to wing a job as an iOS consultant and kind of blagged my ability and I turned up not going to do anything, but I kind of got away a bit and shipped a few apps and, and kind of went from there. And then, and then that wasn't right for me long term. I knew it wasn't going to work out for me kind of working for someone. I was looking for a role and, and then Jazz just kind of knocked on the door, which was quite good. Um, okay, so let's talk a bit about the, the app and um, certain features. Um, what would you say, um, yeah, tell us some features of Mismatch that make it not the Muslim Tinder. Yeah, sure thing. So I guess the big thing is anonymity. So for a lot of people, a lot of kind of Western apps, it's all about what you look like. And a huge difference on Mismatch is you can have full privacy. So you can use a nickname, disguise your identity, and blur your photos. So that, that is very different. And, the, the information in the profile, which which you know our users you know share to the community, kind of makes it work. So it's a big thing. Um, we've got things like a chaperone feature, so the, the concept of a wally for women, but we let we let both genders use it. So the idea is that you know the new generation want to find their partner on their own terms, but they still want to integrate you know, their family. And I think we're one of the first to actually do that. I think one thing also is you know when you look at an app like ours and the way we you know we've designed it, the way we built it, and the features etc. You know we. We've always had kind of the Western quality in mind in terms of the Western standard. Because remember, look, all you guys, and not, not just here but abroad, you know, you're all using Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook. You know a good app when you see it. And it was always a shame that for the Muslim apps, they were all pretty terrible, you know, be it the website or the apps. They were, you know, you look on the Android store or the, or the app store and you see that they're not great. And we thought, why, why does this have to be the case? So for us, we always wanted to do everything high quality, both in terms of how it looks, how it works, and the features, etc. You know, blending that aspect as well as the, the halal aspects within the app. So, you know, one key thing that we've tried to do within the app um, is just remind people why they're there. You know, you're there to find a partner and in charge to do things the right way. So even little things that you might not even notice. So if somebody uses uh, foul language, for example, it's automatically censored and removed, so you don't even see it. A lot of apps probably wouldn't even think of something like that or wouldn't even include it. Whereas for us, it was the little touches all, all the way throughout, which, which we know are important to people. And that's the kind of thought that we put into it. Um, selfie verification is obviously one of the main features when it comes to signing up. Um, have you come across any hilarious selfies? Who, you know, is it you guys that are literally manually approving people? How does it all work? Yeah, so we have the unfortunate or fortunate job of uh, manually approving every profile. So whenever somebody signs up, they take a selfie um, and we verify that that selfie um, is actually them. So we make sure it matches up with the photos. We've probably seen every single pose you can ever think of. So. The number of men who decide to sign up in the loop, just don't know why. <laughs> and the number of women who decide to put on the old cucumber eyes and then decide to take a selfie, <laughs> it does make us laugh. But for us, this is all, I guess it, you realize that when, when you're signing up to something like this and when you're trying to find a partner, for each individual person, it's a very personal journey. And people put a lot of thought into their profile, uh, what they're putting into it, um, the manner in which they're having conversations with different people, etc., etc. And I think it, just these little things kind of emphasize the, the personal nature of it. But yeah, for us, this is, security side is very important. Yeah, no, it's actually a nice connection to our users. So we'll touch on fundraising, but you kind of lose that. And if you go back to the moderating profiles and you see people, you know, in their bed doing a selfie, and it's a, it's a huge responsibility, right? And that's kind of why we're so passionate about doing this right. Um, one of the features that you mentioned was the Wally feature. Um, is it something that is actually quite commonly used? Um, is it mainly women active for it or are men too? Yeah, I guess it used to just be women only, and then when we kind of went live uh, with YC, which again we might talk about, uh, we kind of got a lot of press, and a lot of people said, why is it only for women? And we actually thought, why is it only for women? It should be for both, both genders, right? Uh, I didn't have the stat. Do you know the stat? I think for men, yeah, for men we, it's about 10% of users um, have a chaperone. And we've actually, within the app, we've actually made it a little bit easier and a bit clearer in terms of the chaperone feature and how it, how it works and how it's shown in the app. So it, it can be for some people, they'll see it on someone else's profile when or, or someone else's chat when they're talking to them, and then they'll have a dig around and add it into theirs if they want. So um, 
you know, for a lot of people, they're very comfortable having, you know, owning that whole journey of finding someone, etc. But there's a significant minority who, who, who actually do want to involve a family member or somebody else, just to make sure that there's a, an extra pair of eyes. And for us, it's very transparent. So if there's a chaperone in there, um, we make it very clear to the other person you're talking to that there's essentially a third party. And the whole point of it is exactly that, is to remind people why you're there, and obviously to, to try and encourage good behaviour. So with over a quarter of a million members, some thousands of members, you guys have plenty of stories. Um, tell us one interesting story and one uh, story of an unusual couple that met because of a mismatch. Uh, yeah, so we have one story, which is, this, this is in the early days of Mosmatch, which uh, actually does still make a laugh. So uh, I think it was probably six months into, uh, into launching the app for the first time. Um, and uh, a man from Uganda sent me an email saying, well, thank you so much, uh, I found my partner on Mosmatch. And I thought to myself, I don't think we have many members in Uganda. So I actually went to the database and I found that he was the only man and obviously he matched with the only woman in Uganda. So I don't know if it's meant to be or really meant to be. <laughs> Bit. I, I guess the other side, if you look at some of the success stories, so, you know, Honda, we have now almost 30 people a day who actually find a partner through our app and they tell us, so they say, oh, I just got engaged, I just got married, um, or thank you very much, I don't need your app, I found someone, which for us is, is literally the perfect news and it's the reason why we, we kind of do it. And some people do give us, you know, the full story in terms of their whole search, their journey, and if we've heard the good and the bad, you know, people who've been in, you know, for example, an abusive marriage before and that's ended and then they've decided to look for a new partner, really struggled um, and then, you know, joined our app and then, you know, hung their own to find someone. Um, it's the real stories of people who've been on that kind of journey, which uh, for us is, is very touching. And it, it does make us realise, uh, as cheesy as it sounds, but you, you, with something like this, you do actually change people's lives. You know, now, I remember, I think it was last week, somebody mentioned that, you know, uh, their wife was pregnant and they met through Mosmac, etc. So it's just little things like that, which just a nice reminder as we go on this journey as well. Um, what would you say is the hardest thing about running an open marriage app? I guess it's, there's, no, uh, there's no textbook how to run this business and it's, it's going a lot on Chaz's faith from where, what we think we can do. And, I think it's navigating that sea. So there's there's certain things that we don't want to be. We don't want to be, you know, a hookup app. And it's and it's making sure that you know we don't. We want to be broad, right? We want we want as many Muslims to use our products possible, but at the same time we want to do it the right way. So I think it's always just navigating that. And from my point of view, obviously that's not my expertise. So it's it's kind of again like Shaz said earlier, it's putting my point of view across, but then it's always kind of realigning with what Shaz knows to be right. I think I remember, I remember when I first started, uh, when I first launched this, uh, for about six months I literally didn't hear anything from anyone, uh, you know, in terms of anyone actually finding a partner, and I thought, okay, well, this, is, this is tough, have I, have I just made an app that just helps guys and girls chat, you know, have I made the one thing that I didn't want to make? Um, but then, you know, I remember, I remember the very first email when somebody said, oh, I, I, you know, I just got engaged with your app, and then it literally was like a snowball, um, and then it was like, you know, two people a week, and then it grew and grew and grew. And I remember the first one was the point at which uh, it kind of um, answered my doubt as to what I was doing and why I was doing it. And for us, it, it's really steered what we try to do. You know, it's very easy to make an app, you know, it's very easy to make a, a generic chat app. It's super easy. Um, for us, in terms of the, our design of the app, the way we built it, the particular things we ask of you, you know, even in the app, we ask you when you're looking to get married. Because what we found early on was that for some people there was a real disconnect between people who wanted to get married ASAP versus people who were a little bit more chilled out and were looking two years ahead. So it's little things like that that we've thought about in terms of how can we actually match you better. Um, and uh, for, for this, exactly that, it guides us in terms of the products because you know, ultimately, you know, me as a Muslim, I need to make sure that we do whatever we do is inshallah halal. Um, so I guess on that point, um, what do you do when people get reported? How do you guys go about investigating um, the bad people? It happens. I mean, look, with, with any app where you bring people together, it happens. You know, there's this, you know, when you're dealing with relationships, it can be very messy. Anything can happen. And you're bringing two people together who could be completely different. Um, and the scope is there. Um, in our app, we actually have a lot of protection within the app. So, like I mentioned, you know, the, the language filters, um, even to the point where we encourage users to actually keep the conversation in the app. Because then we can keep an eye uh, and we can monitor what's going on. Uh, for us, in terms of any reports that, that, that that um, are reported. Every single one is manually followed up. So literally myself or Ryan, and we'll actually go through, we'll look at the chat, we'll see what was said, we'll take action. 
and we're, we're quite brutal. So if we see something which is straight up inappropriate, they'll be gone and blocked. And because we register you with your phone number, they can't rejoin, or it's very difficult to rejoin. Um, and up, you know, today we put in, removed and blocked, I think about 4,000 people since we launched um, for an array of different reasons. And for us, you know, it's not necessarily a number we shout about, but it's something that we do want people to know because we take it seriously. And we don't care if that's a paying customer, if they've paid us a lot, we don't care. Literally, if you do something dodgy on the app and you're inappropriate, we'll block you. Um, and that's something that we take very seriously. Because an app like this, it works on reputation. A, it works on people saying, you know what, I actually found my partner on this match, you should check it out, number one. Or number two, somebody saying, actually, I met some really good people on there, you know, so the potential is definitely there. We know there are other websites and other services out there which unfortunately don't have great reputations. And this was one of the drivers of, of me starting this app way back when because I wanted to do something different and inshallah do it right. Nothing to add. <laughs> Um, okay, so when you obviously first launched the app, it was a basic MVP which you basically built in the bedroom. Um, then you relaunched it. What was that whole process in terms of rebuilding from scratch like? It was a bit of a roller coaster because when you when you come on board at a startup where it is just one person, you know, really bright, driven person, and they're obviously not used to working on that product together, and it was just like making sure we. We had one shot with a relaunch, I think, but we actually did it, but in our minds we did, so it was like everything has to be perfect for August 27th when we did it, and I think it was just, yeah, we, looking back it's a bit of a blur, but we literally rebuilt like, everything, and there was, Bishaz, it was an MVP, it was a prototype, a lot of it was you know, based on tutorials or whatever, it was from my background, kind of bring some standards in, but at the same time kind of balancing the time deadline, um, and also it was just getting to know each other as well, so it was quite a, quite a fun journey. I say fun now, it wasn't so fun at the time. Yeah, definitely wasn't fun at the time. <laughs> uh, I remember because it was exactly that. It was, do you try and incrementally, incrementally um, introduce the new version, the new changes? Or to an extent, do you bite the bullet, take the pain? Um, and if you remember, and I know there's quite a few members here, because I recognise your faces. Um, <laughs> if you remember way back when, it was August 2016 we relaunched, and essentially everybody had to make a new profile. So it really was like a bit of a reset. Um, you know, which to a lot of people that's straight pain, you know, as a, as a business, do you want to do that? Um, but we balanced, look, do we try and budge it all the way through and bring people along, um, you know, without them having to do this? Or do we just essentially create what will be the foundation of our company going forward and just take the pain and go for it? And we decided on the latter. And I think so far we've proved out, <laughs> hopefully. Um, Ryan, you mentioned getting to know each other. Um, yeah, I guess like how did you kind of figure out that Mismatch was kind of the company that you kind of want to join as a co-founder? What was it about Shazam's vision that kind of led you here? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I guess to me, like I said, it was when you when I look at the MVP, you know, it wasn't it wasn't. It's easy to look at us now and think that's where we were, you know, eighteen months ago. We weren't there then, but. What I did see rough around the edges was this, again, opportunity. And Shaz, Shaz could see it too. And it was, I think you've got a bit of a dreamer, right? And in the back of your mind, whenever you're working on like this, you can kind of see where you want to get to. And I immediately saw where we wanted very us to get to. And I think, it seems like it's going, but I, I wouldn't, I guess some advice is don't like waste your time on kind of small things if you can. And it's very easy to say that. But when, when something big comes along, you're like, okay, I've got to get involved. Awesome. Okay, so um, you guys have recently raised $1.5 million in America. So um, you guys were obviously accepted on Y Combinator. Um, for anyone in the audience that doesn't know what Y Combinator is, please explain what that is and what was the three month acceleration process like? Uh, so Y Combinator is essentially a, uh, called a tech accelerator stroke incubator. So um, they, I think they actually are the world's most prestigious one. Um, and it's very, very hard to get into. So. I think on each batch, they have two batches a year, um, and roughly about 13,000 people apply. They call about 800 out to San Francisco to interview, and then only about 100 are selected. Um, and we actually got in on our second shot. So we applied the first time in November 2016, and um, essentially they said, look, we really like your business, we really like what you're going for. Uh, and remember, this is, you know, it's a, it's a Muslim marriage app. It's quite alien to, to any non-Muslim, to be honest. It's quite a novel concept. Um, but they could see the scope of this, and they just said, look, come back when you prove that this can be a business, uh, when you have revenue and you, you've, got, you've got something tangible to show. So we went back and we, we worked on, on those aspects, um, and then when we came back and we applied, it was a lot more straightforward for us. You know, we could, we could show them a clear picture of how things had progressed. 
In terms of the program itself, you know what they uh, what they gear you up to do is essentially. Ultimately, if you look at it, at the heart of it, they help you raise investment. So they help shape your company um, in a way that is very investor friendly. So whether it's making sure that your product fit is, is on point uh, and you've nailed that, or whether it's in terms of the presentation of your company, how you talk to investors and what you talk about, and the particular areas that investors are interested in. You know, these guys are probably the best at what they do in terms of, uh, in terms of this. Um, and they're, I guess they're very successful, you know, Dropbox, Airbnb, a whole host of others have come out of Y Combinator. Um, and in Silicon Valley, it's, you know, it's, they have a very high benchmark in terms of their standing. Yeah, it's like $80 billion of companies gone through YC in 12 years. The nearest one is, uh, what is it? Uh, I don't know what it's called. They've done $5 billion of company. And it's not really about the big numbers. I think it's 500 stars, yeah. It's more just that kind of mentality. And it was, yeah, we, we were really pleased. We were the first uh, Muslim company to get into YC. I don't know said that. So. They obviously told you to go generate revenue, um, so you've got a bit of a premium model. How did you figure out the business model that you guys were going to go for? Yeah, I guess, uh, I think we always knew very early on what we could charge. So we didn't go overboard with the free. The free option's great, uh, but there was features like, you know, more search filters, seeing more profiles a day, these kind of obvious things, instant match. And I think very, I, I mean, when I joined, and even before, I think you, you thought of these a long time ago. So yeah, to us, they were quite obvious, some of them. And I think one thing for us, and that we've always tried to do as well, is you know we want our free products to be really good, like really good. Um, you know, to the point where I think you know 90 odd percent of people don't pay us a penny, and that's totally cool. You know, we're happy with that. Uh, and plenty of people have got married and never paid us a penny, which we're super chuffed about. Um, for us, the, the monetization was more an exercise in terms of showing that yes, this can be a business, and yes, uh, it's sustainable. Because up till then, it wasn't sustainable as a business, if you will. Um, and now, obviously, it is. And the way we've gone about it is exactly that. We've tried to offer features in addition to uh, the free product, which people optionally can pay for. So they're all features that, if you really like them, you really want them, you can pay for it. If you don't and you don't need them, don't, you don't have to pay for it. And that's, for us, we wanted our paid options to be really good value. So where people actually do want to pay for it versus, in a sense, being hooked in and then forced to pay to, to use the app. We don't want to go down that road and, you know, we haven't so far. Um, okay, so how much money did you put in before you went and raised, and why did you go, guys go all the way to America to raise, and did you manage to get any Muslim investors on board? Uh, so yeah, so I guess up till um, I was flying out to the States, um, I'd put in about 150 grand, something like that, of my savings and stuff. So I basically, I, you know, when I quit my job, I'd intentionally saved up to quit my job. Um, you know, I worked hard, and I always knew I wanted to do my own business, whatever that was going to be. Um, and anyone who knows me knows I'm good at saving. <laughs> so, uh, so I saved up, um, you know, which gave me the funds and the, the ability to take this risk, which it was a risk. You know, you, you quit your job and you do something, and for two years, literally, we didn't see a penny. You know, I did take a salary, there was no money coming in, etc., etc. Um, it was only when we we proven the business out that, you know, we were in that position where we obviously could then raise investment and then obviously start taking salaries, etc. Uh, and kind of running this as a proper business. Um, in terms of the investors, um, unfortunately, no, we don't have any Muslim investors, which for us has actually been a, a real shame. Um, and it's not for one of trying. You know, we, we spoke to a lot of Muslim investors, a lot of various um, entities which uh, have Muslim connections. And I think my, my taking my observation from this is I don't think the Muslim scene is ready to invest in tech yet or have the appetite yet. Um, I think we're behind, and that's the honest truth. Um, we're still slightly stuck on the old uh, markets of property, of energy, of utilities, etc. Um, and we haven't caught up. And you know, now if you look at things like SoftBank and the tie with Saudi, etc., uh, now it's a bit of a, a, a mad dash to, to somehow get involved in tech. Um, and the problem is, it's on the ground, the corporate smaller funds are, are still behind. Um, and I think that's just something we need to catch up on. Okay, cool. Um, so, what advice would you give to uh, the aspiring entrepreneurs there? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say, but I guess it's, it's just to do it, and it's to try and not... So, I guess my background, talking about the companies I did, I founded my first company when I was 18, and again, it was I was self-taught, and I guess it's just doing it, and it, so it sounds very easy to do. Um, I think it's first... Go out there, find that your market exists, and don't do any work until you've got some kind of interest or indicator of interest. You know, don't don't spend six months building something, put it out, and no one wants to use it, right? So get that, and, and then again, it is 
it's as simple as doing it, and it sounds so cliche about failure, but it's very important to, to just try and do it and get it out there. And yeah, I think I think yeah, a lot of people don't think they can. They don't might not be technical either. Every single person that's technical now wasn't technical at some point. Again, I don't see that as a, a limiting factor. I think spot on. Um, you know, don't underestimate what you can actually do yourself um, when you start up. Because when you start up, it's usually unless you you both come in at the start and you both have the idea together and you form it. Um, you know, ultimately, the one person will be the trigger um, to, to start this whole thing. And what does it take? It takes A, it takes a risk. So you have to be willing to risk whatever you're doing, call it your normal nine to five, to start something else, number one. Number two is, okay, the nature of the business that you want to do, it's hard, right? Doing any, any business at all, you know, even um, a norm, even a cash and carry, it's not, it's not necessarily straightforward. Um, it's a lot, there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. So you have to care sufficiently enough and have, you know, where everyone talks about the passion of what you're building, you need it because it's, you know, it, there are times otherwise where it does get quite tough and it can get a bit depressing. And if you don't care enough about what you're doing, plenty of people will give up and, and they'll kind of go nowhere. And there's no point kind of starting a business, running it for a year, then losing kind of either faith or, or hope in it or just losing interest. And then it's kind of a wasted year. So have some focus, um, have a strong idea, like Ryan said. Um, and secondly, yeah, have the ability and the, the willingness to actually skill up. So if you don't know how to code, learn how to code. Um, you know, when I learned how to build apps, you know, I remember I was, I was getting up at 7 a.m., I go to sleep at 1 a.m., and I was just learning how to build apps. You know, and, and Apple at the time, for those who were Apple developers, it was Objective-C, which is a horrible language. And uh, I learned that, and I was close to giving up. I remember I did for about a month, and I thought this is too difficult. Uh, but I just stuck at it, and then it was literally within a week, um, I kind of overcame some sort of hurdle, and it just became straightforward and a lot more, a lot easier to, to do. Um, so ju I just literally say, stick with it, um, and, and learn the skills, um, and apply it, and start building something. Because until you've done something, it's just an idea, and everyone always says ideas are cheap, and they really are. Um, you know, ten people can have the same idea, but it's the person who puts the effort in and puts the real um, uh, aggression into actually building it who will ultimately be, be successful. You mentioned failure. What mistakes have you made so far um, while building the app that you've learned from? I, I, yeah, more mistakes. I, I guess the, the only real mistake was that, uh, well, I wouldn't even say mistake. It was just a call of when we relaunched, we could have done a few things differently, but we did in this kind of hindsight. So the only the kind of thing that we did make clear enough to our users was that when you re-registered with version 2, your matches hadn't been deleted, but you couldn't see your matches until the other person had also re-registered. And we did a really, really bad job of making that clear. And on hindsight, it was kind of silly, but like Shaz said, we took the bullet and it kind of worked. So I think that one sticks out to me. Yeah, I think I remember, this is, this is before you go, I don't know if you know about this, but... Uh, uh, the, our servers were actually hosted with a hosting company, and it was on a physical machine, so this was the cloud, I guess, wasn't quite what it was now, or what it is now. Um, and it was a physical machine, and I remember that machine actually died, um, and for about a week, I lost a week's worth of members, chats, everything. I lost a ton of data. I don't think I slept for about a week just trying to, to, try to put this thing back together. Um, and after that, I thought cloud computing is the way forward. <laughs> um, what, what can we hope to see of Wizmatch in the future? That would be telling. Um, lots of stuff. So I don't want to give too much away. Um, but we have, we have a lot of ideas in terms of um, ways we can really enrich the whole experience of Having, finding a match number one, we're also interacting with a match. Um, so we want a lot more in the way of virtual communication with, uh, on the app. Um, you know, one thing we're, we're, we're focusing on a lot right now is actually just shouting about the app. You know, up till now, we've, we've diligently been focused on the app itself and just working away. You know, call it kind of in stealth mode, if you will. Um, you know, we intentionally haven't really done much in the way of marketing. You know, Hamza, look, we've grown to a quarter of a million people with next to no marketing. It's been purely word of mouth uh, up till now. Now we're at the point where we really do want to shout about our products and our successes. You know, we have so many people who've got married who, who are happy to tell their story of, of their whole journey. And we want to do a, a really good job in terms of spreading that. So I guess that's the next part. Yeah, I think already we're, some, some investors tell us how good our app is just for a dating app uh, in terms of the features. And I think, yeah, that is just a very small percentage of the ideas we have. So I think we have a global vision and we have some ideas which will help there. So yeah, stay tuned. But that's, that's why we're raising, right? We, we have big ambitions for that. Okay, so let's talk a bit about you guys personally. Um, what's your morning routine like? 
Cool. Morning routine. Uh, cycle into the office, about 40 minutes, um, and then probably an hour and a half uh, taking care of admin from the day before. So, um, you know, even to the point now when customers contact us through the app with queries, with reports, with everything, uh, we deal with it right now. Um, and we do it for two reasons. Um, number one, you know, we actually want to hear what, what our customers are saying. You know, we learn a lot from what they're saying, what they're complaining about, what they hate, what they like, etc. And literally, you hear it directly, and sometimes very directly. Um, so we, so we, we take care of that, we take note of what's been going on. Um, we usually have a look at our stats in terms of how we've done versus uh, you know, this time, last week, etc. And just see if anything sticks out. Um, and then already, I think we, we pretty much have an idea of the kind of stuff that we're going to build, let's say for that week, and we crack on. So I'll let Brian kind of talk about Yeah, um, for my routine, it's hard. I guess one thing to talk about being a founder is trying to compartmentalize your day. So I, I meditate and I do yoga in the morning, which sounds terrible, but I do it. And I try not to look at any email or Slack. And it, it's weird, it's, you can spend half an hour just looking at Google Analytics and doing absolutely nothing, so I try not to do that. And then yeah, it's, it's getting to work, and it's, uh, I, guess, uh, I guess for us, in our, the way we look at things is, is we're trying to listen to user feedback, we were point about user feedback, but uh, also keep our vision, and keep sure what we need to do. And again, random point about user feedback, but it's, you always hear a really loud vocal minority, and uh, it's very difficult. At, the, at this time, and yeah, quarter million users isn't that big, but we still might get a thousand emails in a day about one feature. Again, though, as a percentage of the people using that day, it's not even, you know, whatever percentage is very low, it's single digits, right? So it's trying to see through the noise and trying to go with your gut and extract out what is best for the product. I think you spoke about user feedback, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, Shaz? Thanks. <laughs> no, no, I think ultimately, look, a lot of the, um, you know, I mentioned in terms of when customers actually come back to us with various points that they like, that they hate, things that they don't quite understand in the app. For us, they're drivers in terms of the areas that we know we probably need to work on. Um, you know, so for example, there might be a certain feature in the app where it's, it seems crystal clear to us, um, probably because we've developed it and built it, but for the general public customer who, who's using it, they might literally have no idea how it works or how it should work. And for us, our job is hopefully to make that, that straightforward and easy. Um, so I, I would say that. I'd say what, one thing when you when you obviously have a startup, and right now, look, the team is, is two of us. Um, you know, inshallah, we have two more people joining in the next couple of weeks. Um, you know, so we're already kind of putting that invest, investor money to work. Um, and now the, the goal is really to, to expand what we're doing. So, um, we're, to, you know, to a degree, we both kind of do everything. We both do development, we both do the admin, we both do all the technical work, the design, etc., etc., etc. And you have to. When you're building a company, everyone has to do everything. And when you have a small team, the same will apply. You know, I remember, uh, so one of the, uh, this, the CEO of Y Combinator now um, was one of the co-founders of Twitch. Um, so they were the live video platform that was bought by Amazon for like a billion dollars. And I remember he was saying for, it might have been for a good couple of years, it was just six people um, who built essentially the, the basis of this company. And he said the key was everybody kind of did everything. So, you know, for example, they didn't necessarily hire one developer with one skill set. He said, look, you just need to learn the, the other skills that we need as well. And it's that kind of mindset you need to have. Because otherwise, you would hire, you would hire 10 people and 10 different people do 10 different things. You would burn a lot of money and you probably would move very slowly. Whereas if you all really do get stuck in, um, you can move a lot, a lot faster. So a big part of our, our day is literally juggling 10 different different things, whether it's designing a new feature, working on the database side of things, working on the back end, um, making sure everything kind of plugs together versus taking care of the customer stuff, etc. And in between all of that, we're still administering profiles. So as new people are registering, we're making sure are they legit and can we improve them, etc. So just sprinkle that into the mix. Okay, so uh, last two questions before we open up to the floor. Um, Shaz, how have you found kind of, I guess, being a minority kind of in the tech world? And I guess this is to you as well, Ryan. Um, in terms of um, how do you go about, I guess, making sure that the app is inclusive to a lot of different Muslim experiences as well? Uh, so being a minority in the tech world, um, I would actually say, look, you know, the way I've approached Match, and even when we talk to investors and the way we've kind of gone about the whole journey is not to, you know, we're not ashamed of what we are, right? So we're Muslim, we find a partner this way. And, you know, one of my opening lines on a lot of my pictures is, you know, Muslims don't date, we marry. And that's, you know, at the heart of it, that's kind of how we look at this. So it's really just embracing how we do things, um, you know, because that's essentially the reason why Muslim Match exists and the reason why we think other people don't necessarily get it. 
And you know, for us, that's just part of our, our edge in terms of what we're building. Um, so you know, definitely don't be embarrassed by it at all. Um, you know, no doubt you'll always have people who uh, maybe maybe dismiss you or, or just think, oh, this is a small idea, etc. So be it. You know, you, you need to have faith in what you're doing to, to really push through and do it. So. In all honesty, I would take the minority aspects out of it. Um, you know, maybe it's a little bit hard to raise money. I don't know. I know, let's say with Y Combinator, they're making a, a very specific effort to um, to be more inclusive. So they're they're making uh, a bigger effort to actually go abroad to India, to Africa, to actually bring founders from different countries. Um, you know, one of the the, the, the statements by the, the CEO of Y Combinator was essentially that he found YC at the time, you know, too white and too male, and, and that probably applies to a lot of tech. So you know, it's on us. You know, the call it the Muslim generation as well as other minorities to to get stuck in because you know there is a lot of exciting things happening and um, I think it's a it's an opportunity that we should try and get hold of as well. I guess the the product point of that is uh, we we work hard to try and connect people that might not normally connect with one another. So obviously within our app you can have your preferences and people for whatever reason are quite specific with their preferences. But there's a part in the app called Explore where we do show you people only filtered by your age and location, and we have had countless success stories where people have gone together and ended up marrying to people they never dreamt of, you know, marrying, right? You know, outside their comfort zone, outside their family's comfort zone, comfort zone. So I guess from a, a non-Muslim product point of view, I'm really proud of that. So I think, you know, it, again, it's, it's trying to connect people that might not connect normally. And this goes back to exactly us trying to do things a little bit differently. Um, you know, a lot of other services, and, and you know, anyone who's been on this journey knows you're trying to find a partner, and everyone has 15 tick boxes that must be ticked before they'll even, you know, sit down and, and have, have a chat with them. And we know, look, that doesn't necessarily lead to success. For some people, it might, but it's it's very hard to. Um, so what we've tried to do is is exactly that: show people who we think might be a good match, but who necessarily aren't in all your filters. You know, there was a study done by eHarmony uh, where they actually looked at the conversations people had on their service, and what they found was people were willing to have a conversation with someone even if they weren't directly within their, their set preferences, purely because there was an interest showing on one side or the other. Uh, and I think that's the key for us, and this kind of goes back to us trying to do things a little bit differently. Um, you know, for us, you know, Honda, we've had so many weddings of people from completely different ethnicities, backgrounds, etc. You know, combinations you've never dreamt of, trust me. Um, and it's, for us, it's really great to see, because we know we've, it kind of goes back to us doing things a little bit differently, and hopefully pushing us in the right direction. Awesome. I'm obvious to everyone, we have a real social problem. You know, we have a real problem of essentially the youth finding it really hard to find a partner. And no one's solving that. And it, the problem's only getting worse. You know, we talk about divorce rates, etc., etc. Um, all of these things are really making this whole space really difficult for Muslims. Um, so we're actually making a positive contribution. You know, I remember we were at a, an award ceremony now, it was six months ago, uh, and quite a well-known matchmaker came up to me and, and said, you know what, I just really want to congratulate you in terms of what you guys have been doing. Um, because it's actually working. You know, so many people that she's met and got to know, um, you know, through her own, call it offline service, have actually got married through Muzmatch. Um, because she sees there's a real problem in the community. I think in terms of backlash, you know, I've actually had um, a sheikh and, and, and an imam as well, who actually tried the app out. Um, we've kind of asked them for feedback as well. We want them to try it out, you know, we're not trying to, uh, you know, in a way we want to do this in a positive way, um, and in collaboration with, with call it the elders and, and, and that community. Because for us, you know, we want to make sure we have credibility. Um, and for us, all, all, ultimately, look, our intentions are good in terms of what we're trying to build as well. And that essentially guides the product and guides what we're building as well. I can't, I can't add to that, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? So if you're starting a company and you require funding, look for the various factors. How would you obtain the funding? And what would be the best process? I guess, 
guess the question is, is why do you need the funding? So Shaz was quite different in that he, he saved up. When you saved up, and he actually quit the job. And I don't think you necessarily need to do that. I think, again, it goes back to no investors ever. It's really hard to raise money, right? No investor would ever invest in an idea. And again, I don't think, unless it's like a bank and you need some kind of certification, I don't know many ideas you need to do it. But if you do, Shaz can maybe help. Yeah, I think definitely, you know, one thing, and even, you know, why Confidence mentioned it, but look, if you don't, if you don't quit your job to do wherever your idea is, um, no one's going to give you money, really. Um, because if you can't take that risk and believe in whatever it is you're building, um, very few people actually give you the money, number one. But number two, I'd actually say, look, depending on the nature of the idea, if it's tech, you know, I read a, a blog post uh, a couple of months ago, and he was talking about how now with you know you need less and less money to start a tech business because so many things are kind of done for you so the server the back end etc it's all on the cloud uh, various parts let's say your database etc or various aspects of your business you can build the foundations of your company or at least the prototype stage very cheaply um, through cloud services etc where well, remember five six you know seven years ago you didn't have that it was a lot more expensive to actually have the hardware to do this stuff you needed hardware you need to take care of all of this so things have moved on a lot so I think it goes back to, you know, A, the, the, the cost of starting the business are going down, if it's just tech, let's say. Uh, but number two, look, and this goes back to my early point, you can do a lot yourself. You know, a lot of people who started a business, and especially a tech one, have worked for nothing, you know, and, you know, they'll have a part-time job just to cover their costs of paying the bills, etc., etc. But it takes hard graft to actually do something, um, you know, build a business, and I think people need to realise that is kind of the sacrifice you need to make if you want to start something like this. Any more questions? Let's just get you to shout. Sure. Um, hello. Uh, thanks very much. It's a really good talk. So you, you guys have built a, a social network for Muslims, which is, is what Islamic Makers is as well. It's a different kind of social network for Muslims. And so I was wondering, like, if you have any, like, what's your philosophy in terms of, like, serving groups that are sort of underserved, especially by tech, but sort of by society generally in the West? and sort of making dedicated experiences versus trying to make do with what else is out there and carve out spaces in places that don't cater as well to, to their needs? I guess quickly on the latter point, yeah, there's a, in terms of carving out, I guess some people might say, well, you can filter for Muslims on Match.com. And I think with, with our you know, case, it, it, it's quite a specialist search, so it makes sense for us to have a standalone product. It might not for all use cases, but I think for us it really did. So I, I guess it depends on the product, but for us for sure. I think for us it's, it's you know, if, if you're looking to marry a Muslim, you almost don't need a service where there's non-Muslims on it, right? So it just makes sense to have a dedicated tool. I think, like you're right, it's, you know, it's a niche. It's a large niche, the, the Muslim market. And you know, for us the way we, we look at it is, you know, we try to appeal to the diversity of Muslims that are out there, because you know, not all, all Muslims aren't equal, you know, people are, different in terms of religiosity, in terms of the way they practice, etc, etc. There's a lot of diversity in call it the Muslim market. And so the way we built the app and the way we have certain features, so be it the privacy option as, a, as an example, it's an option. We don't force it on anyone, it's just there if you want it. For some people, it'll be really important to them and they'll, and they'll really value that. For others, they might not even put a second thought into it. And that's fine. Um, so the way we try to build it, to build the app, sorry, is to really appeal to the diverse mix of Muslims that we have. Um, and again, look, the, the, the core purpose of, of Muzmatch is, you know, essentially you are a Muslim or you're, you're seeking to marry a Muslim. That's the heart of it. Obviously, you might find Muslims on other services, but the intent of why they're there might be different. You know, so if you're on a different app, they might not, not necessarily be looking for marriage. So it's having that alignment from the beginning in terms of why they're on the app in the first place. More questions? Great. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for your Uh, it's hard. <laughs> I'm not even sure my parents still know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they, I mean, they, they support me. It, I think for sure, you know, the moment you kind of come home and say, oh, you know, mum, dad, I just quit my job and I'm going to start this thing, I think they're thinking, what the hell? You know, you went to university, you were paying all these fees and now you're just uh, throwing it all away. Um, it's, look, it's a risk and 
you have to have sufficient self-belief to, to, to sort of stick with it. Um, you know, for, for different people, you know, I was lucky, you know, in inverted commas in that, I, um, you know, I'd already had, or I'd built kind of my career, if you will, and I, I'd built that foundation. Um, you know, whereas for now, and I look, I look now, it's a lot harder for people, you know. Um, if you just look at job prospects, salaries, wages, the environment is a lot tougher now than, you know, it, it, you know when I was kind of progressing my career, things were kind of doing this in terms of call it the global macro trend, etc. Um, it's, it's a lot tougher now. But one thing you find is, look, when things get tough, that's when opportunities do start. Because the easiest thing is, everyone's on a nice, well-paid job, everyone's comfortable, and for the most part, everyone was sticking their job and just carry on doing that. When things get tough, people have to be resourceful, and people are, in a way, forced to start a business because they need another option. They know wherever job they're doing, A, either isn't going anywhere, or B, isn't really going to pay what they want, what they want it to pay. So then they're forced to start a business. So there are, you know, these are positives when you when you look at things. You know, new businesses do start in tough times as well. The, the, the flip side is, and what makes it difficult is, if the business is fairly capital intensive, if you need a lot of money to actually start it, and if the environment is the way it is now, it can be very difficult. So that's something you have to bear in mind. But ultimately, look, A, you have to have a good idea. You have to have a plan as well. You really do need to have a plan. Um, when I was in the States, I was amazed actually the, and maybe it's because you're in San Francisco, everyone, all everyone talks about is startups, I want to have a startup, I want to, I want to build a business, etc., etc. And you look at everybody, and you know some people, they, they, they're not cut out for it, really. Um, they have the dream of it, but you know, it takes a lot to be an entrepreneur or to start a business, and a lot of real graft is, is needed. And some people, you, you can just tell, they'll never quite cut it, number one. Or number two, they literally won't have a plan, and they'll say, I want to quit my job, and I want to figure it out which is probably the wrong answer, because you should try and have a plan, um, do your homework while you're still working, do all the stuff you can do while she's still working and have an income, and when, you, when you're ready in a strong position, then say, all right, you know what, everything kind of makes sense, I know what I'm going to be doing for the next six months, 12 months, give yourself a deadline, quit your job and do it, and if it doesn't work out, make an assessment and say, you know what, should I go back to work or not? Um, but you really have to kind of really go all the way, you can't just be in the middle, because you'll end up going nowhere, and you quit your job, and then you'll be like, all right, I'm unemployed now. So, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think there was a point where I wanted to drop out of university, and this was in the summer, so my second start of guest all, which was a social guest, guest at app for clubs, so an event organ, I was making guest list, and they would put it out there, and, and friends and family or whatever can add names to it, and it, it used, a, at the time, in, well, five years ago, Facebook, it went super viral, so it integrated really well Facebook, and kind of, it was mad how much traction. Anyway, so I was like, you know, to my parents, you know, it was the summer then, this thing's taking off, I really want to do it full time, and you know, make money out of this. And they were like, kind of like, no, you know, they, they weren't technical. They both were self-employed, but in very boring industries. And they were like, no, you know, you shouldn't do that, whatever. And it got to November of me in my second year of university when I actually was like, can I do this now? And again, I think, I think entrepreneurs have a lot of self-belief, but you do need credibility and you do need evidence. And again, it goes back to don't just quit your job with an idea, for heaven's sake, like, at least like prototype the thing or whatever. And then, then with that comes the credibility. I think, Storytelling as well, being entrepreneurs, you'll get better and better at honing like, how you tell the story, and I think you'll quickly convince someone like your family member because they're kind of already on your side anyway. So. Yeah, that's a big Thank you. Sure thing. So we don't. So we encrypt using SSL and things like this uh, between our users and us and the server, and we have all sorts of security to protect the data. We don't encrypt the chats. So the chats aren't like WhatsApp, and we do this for good reason. You know, we we need to protect our users. We need to see these conversations. So we're not, and we made this very clear to our users. You know, the reason why we can be so good at moderating is if we need to. And again, we never really look at chats unless we have to, but we can see it, and that is important to us. So again, we. We could go down that route of being you kind of Snapchat, you know, things disappear, or whatever, but we don't want to do that because if we want to look after our users. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so you mentioned that you have a um, so, so like I said, we have two people starting 
you know, each other the next couple of weeks, um, focusing on various things. One aspect, exactly that, is to focus on some of the um, smarter stuff we can do in terms of the whole verification process. So there's stuff with AI, machine learning, and all those cool kind of words. Um, you know, some of that stuff that we can definitely throw into the mix in terms of getting smarter about doing various levels of, a, of the approval process. So detecting why other photos, even of a person, or is this person, you know, uploaded a photo of a kettle or something random? Um, and then what we do is, you know, once we've done those those kind of basic checks, um, for us it's always important to have one last manual check of somebody physically looking at the profile and saying, does this make sense or not? Because as good as computers will be or, or, or are, um, nothing actually beats that in terms of spotting um, people who shouldn't be on our app, um, as well as spotting people who are trying to get past the system. Um, you know, with all this, as we've grown, you know, up till now. The way we built it, you know, we kind of built our, call it our dashboard that we do all the administration from. Um, so now it's kind of actually can be very um, quick in terms of taking care of that whole process. But no doubt, the, the faster we're growing, and now, you know, we have nearly a thousand people joining every day now. Um, so it's becoming more and more of an inverted commas burden. So that's something that we definitely do want to work on a lot more. I think this is quite a fun problem. So why is he trying to get to talk about what's your biggest problem? I think for sure that's one of them. Like. Like Shaz says, no matter how much we automate it, we always still want a person that we trust, us at the moment, or someone else approving it. And we've got some ideas there, but for sure, it's kind of a, in a way, it's a good problem to have, right? But it's definitely a problem. And for now, we're, we're, we're well, forever, we're not going to move off having a human look at it. So we'll just keep staying up all night for now. Okay, um, well, first of all, thank you so much for uh, joining us um, today. Hopefully, it's been a inspiring for everyone. It clearly has been for me. Um, round of applause, please. <laughs> I'm just going to hand it over to uh, Murtaza. So, um, we're actually, I'll just let him do all the talking rather than me giving it all away. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, just want to say, Jazz Ryan, you're doing amazing stuff. Um, I think to come to an event like this, to kind of speak how you've spoken to show us, to see people like you getting into YC is just, it's just amazing for us. So just another round of applause for you. Of cool, so look, I, um, I don't want to take too much uh, time because we've got pizzas getting cold. Um, essentially, we've been, we've been going for uh, what was that last year? year and a half. year and a half, right? So uh, Fahim, where's Fahim being in the room? So me, our friend Fahim, as well as some very close friends that we kind of uh, roped in to, to, to check things were working on. We were going for about a year and a half. And um, it's been going really well. And I think part of that is we're always really conscious about the community. And we're always really conscious that we do this kind of on the side. We've, we've got full-time roles. We're trying to hustle on the side with this thing. Um, but we want to keep on growing it. We want this to get bigger and bigger. We want to have more interesting conversations. So, so part of that is we sat down and we kind of had to think about, okay, how can we kind of um, help people and kind of like help that kind of mobilization of what we're doing? Um, and so kind of our like half-baked solution um, was this manifesto, right? So usually we kind of debate it and say, like, manifestos are really dead. Um, as soon as you write them, they're kind of not really worth the paper they're written on. Um, so instead of a kind of traditional, hey, you guys read it and tell us how much you love it, what we've done is we've kind of had a first stab, right? So we sat down in a room for a number of hours, pretty frustrating hours, um, talking about what we think we're good at, um, looking at all the feedback that we've had from you guys who've been coming to the events, from people who've been hitting us up online. Um, yeah, and really kind of sitting down to think about what are the kind of key things that we believe in, um, and going forward, how are we going to try and grow this movement going forward? Um, because ultimately, we want more and more people kind of joining us. We want more and more people kind of helping, helping us out to run this stuff taking ownership of this, we're just trying to create that space, right? So, I won't read it word for word, unless you want me to. Um, but basically, if you go to our site, we've got um, a manifesto page, and what would be really, really awesome is if you can just share it with everyone and anyone you can. Anyone who's got a vested interest in this community, uh, we want to hear from you, right? And uh, the kind of easiest way is just hit that link and hit us up with some comments. Um, Essentially, we want this to be a live document, right? That we can kind of mobilize around. Um, this isn't a one-way conversation. This is like pointless if me or a phone thing and sitting in the room talking about stuff. Um, so yeah, this is kind of our first attempt. You know how we are. We keep things really lean. We beg for free space. Uh, we get people to sponsor pizza. Thanks, Sanchez. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to say. And I just want to say thanks again to the guys. And yeah, sign up to the newsletter. Come to our next events as well. I just want to say as well, through this whole community that we I mentioned we're, we're 
more people joining the, the team. And one person has come through this whole dynamic makeup essentially um, and through this community. So this job actually does work. And the whole point of it, look, is to get, you know, as much as we're interested in all this kind of stuff, and just people who want to be involved in startups together, and hopefully, inshallah, to help each other um, with their businesses or wherever, with just advice, etc. And this is a perfect example of, of this in practice. So, you know, this stuff actually does mean something. And they're wearing Android gloves. Yeah, so if anybody knows any Android gloves, get in touch with Irene.